What is at the core of the AI revolution, the revolution in artificial intelligence that we see all around us? Well, it's about a subset of AI called machine learning. And there essentially it's about a subset of machine learning called deep learning. And there essentially as of recent, it's about a subset of deep learning called, called transformer nets, transformer learning. And these lead, for example, to these large language models. And we basically discovered not too long ago that it's all language. Once you can handle language and you solve that language problem, which has to do with attention. And the very important paper there from 2017 is called Attention is All You Need. So what is the AI revolution all about? It's actually about attention. And that led to the fact that we realized that once we solve the language problem, and it doesn't matter if it's natural language like English or Spanish or Mandarin, or if it's language like images or expressed in music or sounds or videos, it's all different kinds of languages. And that's what actually this attention problem, this attention solution has contributed to, to solve. So, well, well I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's get started with AI and give that first of all our attention. So the artificial intelligence paradigm, as I already mentioned, and please check out the, the other lectures, the related lectures that we went through previously, but I give it a short review here, is turning the traditional knowledge process on its head. So traditionally, we have observations of reality. We see something in reality, and once you observe it, we categorize it. Our perception does that. So we basically measure, and measurement goes very deep, and we measure something. We could also like simplistically say we measure one, two, two, one, one, two, three, whatever. We measure something. And then we have a way to combine what we observe. We could observe sceneries, but then we combine it with some kind of recipe. We make sense of it. We call that the algorithm. And in order to get to a conclusion, we compute something. And traditionally, that's what we say, and that's how we teach. Now, the, what happened is of reason we turned it on our head. We feed into the machine, and we will talk about what the machine is, that's what this lecture is about. What is this, what we call computer, this machine? We feed into it observations, data, and where we want to go. And then the master algorithm, uh, that's what Pedro Dominguez calls it, the master algorithm computes the best algorithm. So machine learning is the master algorithm that computes the best algorithm. And there can be different ways that lead to the same result. You could compute it this way here, or you compute it this way here. And what's the better one? Well, that's in the eye of the beholder. And you might choose, or you can ask the machine to choose for you as you wish. So the artificial intelligence paradigm is basically a machine learning paradigm. So what I showed you this framework right now here, that's the crux of machine learning. The machine learns. It learns different ways of doing things. Well, what's the best way that you give the goal to the machine and you give the machine of where it's at and the data input. And then the machine tells you, well, given the constraints, you can do this optimally, in this kind of sense optimally, or you can do that. Uh, but it learns the most important thing is here with data. That's what kicked it off. Artificial intelligence try to do it different ways. Also, usually the previous paradigm, we try to write the recipes ourselves, the rules. But once we had enough data, the digital footprint, once this was abundant, the data of the first generation of the digital age kicked off communication, which produced a flood, a flood of data, which was automatically recorded in our digital networks. We had all this data. We can turn this process around, and we did machine learning. So that's what happened. We, that's thanks to the amount of data. Now, we didn't pay enough attention to this goal here yet, but the most important message that I want to hammer home here is that for all practical purposes nowadays, when people say AI, they mean machine learning. That means you need data, and usually a lot, a lot of data for the machine to work. In a previous lecture, we already went through all these three components that are all around this model here. We went through the data, the lots of data that you need. We went through the goal and we said there are three kinds of goal you can have, supervised machine learning, reinforcement machine learning, unsupervised machine learning. And we went, or we will go in the last lecture actually much more in depth about into the alignment problem. That's what the algorithm is. We have to make sure that the solution that the machine comes up with 
doesn't destroy us maybe you know that would be helpful so we also have to see like that the machine comes up with solutions that are aligned with our human values and we will get to that at the end so if you haven't checked out the previous lecture on machine learning machine learning paradigm please check it out we went in detail over the data input and the goal output and also the algorithm and in lecture in the last uh, set of lectures here we will go much deeper into the artificial intelligence alignment problem what we will do today is we look into this center here, the computer. We didn't look at that one yet. So what is actually going on here? Well, in machine learning, there is some learning going on. But how is this learning happen? Well, the most promising solution, promising solution we ran into here has to do with neural nets. And that has been inspired of how the brain learns as well with neurons. And so neural nets is a subset of machine learning and it's inspired by the brain some of the pioneers for example jeffrey hinton one of the the three so-called godfathers of neural nets has always it was always inspired for the last 40 years to understand how the brain works that was actually the main motivation not to build fancy computers but to understand how the brain works turns out we find out that these machines use neural nets differently than the brain does this is the solution that mother nature came up with and how to use neural nets to compute with tireless blind tinkering mutation selection retention and the evolutionary algorithm but there are other neural network designs that we can use and the most promising here is also very similar to actually what the brain does and that has to do with deep neural nets so neural nets you can have basically an input layer and then you have some some layers in the middle and you have an output layer and that's already a neural net but a subgroup of neural nets is called deep learning deep neural nets and that basically means is that there are several layers here in the middle it's deep so you get some input into your neural net and then you have different layers of neurons that you process information with until you have an output you reach reach some kind of conclusion so we have AI and a subgroup of that is machine learning and a subgroup of that is neural nets and a subgroup of that is deep learning. That's how all this letter soup <laughs> hangs together. Now, why stop here? There are also different kinds of deep learning. For example, recurrent neural nets. They are very much used uh, in, in speech recognition, for example. Actually, it's a subset of recurrent neural nets, which are called long short-term memory. And we will get into that, so, so no worries. But there are also other ones. For example, there are convolutional neural nets, which are used for image recognition. So when you speak with digital device, it's usually a recurrent neural net, and when you see some image recognition or you do something with images usually a convolutional neural network and then there, of course there are the transformers the large language models and we will work our way up to that these are the bart and the chat gpts and the i don't know what these have been the two pioneers in that in that field and they basically came to the conclusion that it's all that it's all language that with language we can we can solve many many problems so Let's go step by step and look into some of these deep learnings, because that's actually what most of when people say AI, they say that this data input and this goal output gets transformed often, especially these are the huge companies, you need a lot of data. So the big companies then do deep learning and that computes, that's the master algorithm. The deep learning is actually the master algorithm that computes the best way of going about it. So let's look into convolutional neural nets. I said, they have been very successful in the image recognition problem, which was a big problem for a long time. And the breakthrough, this, it's also not too long ago, in 2000 and, around 2012, these convolutional neural nets started to win all the competitions. They became better than humans in these kind of tasks of something very qualitative. Before, we always thought computers, they can only do, but they cannot do something qualitative like seeing an image, appreciating the qualitative distinctive, but Turns out, yeah, not too long ago, we figured that out. How can you think about that? One of the first applications is this famous data set that has a bunch of handwritten numbers. And that's what's kind of like our first competition where people tried to solve machines to recognize human written numbers back then. You know, if you had checks or whatever you still had where you had human written numbers was very important. And so we have this here. We want to, at the end, recognize a number four. We could do supervised learning, for example, and train, and do you know what that is? right? Supervised learning from the previous lecture. 
and train the machine to recognize a number four, even so it might not be exactly written in the same sense. How do we do that? Well, we feed the numbers into it, and then in the input layer, we make very simple distinction. Keep it simple, keep it really simple. So for example, you have a neural net, and then you would say like, if there is one layer that detects that one pixel next to it is dark and one pixel next to it is white, and then the one below it is also dark, and the one below it is also dark, and the one next to it is white, then you basically, well, then you have, uh, you use these neural nets in order to record that, and you represent it a line. Now the line can go this way or it can go that way, but that's basically how you then represent it. And it was inspired, of course, of how our retina as well perceives. At the beginning, it just perceives, oh, there's something more dark and something more light and rudimentary eyes of, of, of a more rudimentary species also basically then do that. They distinguish between shadows and represent that in their retina. But then you can go deeper, that's where the deep learning is coming from, into the hidden layers and process something else. For example, it could be that these distinctions actually go horizontally and vertically in a 90 degree angle and then you have a cross or they kind of like go around and slowly but surely start to create a circle. And a circle is also just representation of dots. Think about in a digital, digital display how numbers are represented with, with pixels, for example. And so you now you can recognize circles and crosses. Oh, you recognize that. It's kind of like the, the naive idea that we had. There's a grandmother cell in our brain that recognizes the grandmother. And it's a little bit like that. Because you go further into it, you scale it up. And now you can recognize grandmothers. Well, not there, not but more advanced neural nets would do that. And now you can have different figures here and you can say, okay, so we have this construction, which is kind of like there's a round and there's a cross in it, but is it a four or is it a nine? Not sure. So we now here would compute the output, but usually neural nets don't do that immediately. So they are not only forward, feed forward networks. Often they do that for the first time, but it turned out that it was not very useful. If we would do that and said like, first feed forward, and then we would say like, oh yeah, it's a four, we are done that didn't go so well. So what, what was a big insight was, we should work more with probabilities. So we would go through there and estimate oh, how likely is it that it's actually a line? How likely is it that it's a cross and it's a circle? How likely is that? And then if we come to a decision like this, is this a four and a nine and you do not know, and even as a human, you might not know <laughs> if it's a four or a nine, we give it a probability. And the good thing is to keep the probability slightly apart, but not too much. So I'm exaggerating here and I get, probably get a lot of heat of simplifying things like this here. But you could say at the end, like, okay, give it a 51% for a four and a 49% for a nine. And then what you do is you go backwards. So that's the back propagation algorithm, the famous back propagation algorithm that then goes backwards. And then basically calculates how much would a small change in each weight of these neurons affect the loss or the reward. That's the matching, basically, of the number with the four. And we do that with, I don't know if you recognize that equation here, but that's, yeah, that's the good old chain rule from calculus. You surely ran into it in high school, calculus that was mentioned. I mean, that's from Gottfried Leibniz. That's from 1600, what, 60 or something? So this stuff is cutting edge. No, no it's 1600, 60, whatever, five, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz calculus the chain rule. And that's how we do this backpropagation business. So we basically run the entire thing backwards. The backpropagation is also then, now we discover that it's actually efficient and it's beneficial to do neural nets, design neural nets differently than brains. Final judgment is not out, but for everything we know for now and, and, and what they say is that the brain very unlikely does backpropagation in the same way that artificial neural nets do. Why? Do we have that suspicion? Because in order to do this back, back propagation, you need to understand the entire system as a whole in order to calculate your loss and your reward in this chain rule of calculus. And the brain, we haven't discovered that it has a complete comprehensive understanding of what's going on. It's usually locally. There's the Hebbian rule and there's some local what, wires together, fire, what fires together, wires together. It's more like locally, it doesn't have some control center where it calculates the average over the entire neural net. But that's what we do at least here. So that's a difference. The brain doesn't do back propagation, at least not in that sense that we do in artificial neural nets. And it turned out this back propagation thing is extremely powerful. Whoa, is that powerful? And it solved a lot of issues. And it used, it's used 
in many modern machine learning applications. For example, also in recurrent neural nets. I said they have been around for they have been around for longer since the 1980s, and they are if you talk with Alexa or Siri or a Google or whatever you talk with, with your uh, speech recognition digital device, that's usually goes through recurrent neural nets. What do recurrent neural nets do? Well, they are very good for speech recognition, as in contrast to images, because they take sequential information and then they predict the next thing. Images, you kind of like have to, with convolutional neural net, you have to see the entire picture. Whereas in recurrent neural nets, you basically have a sequence and then you predict the next thing. So let's predict the next thing. We have here, we have our matrix, so that's how we store that information. We have here an A, and after the A comes a B. So usually a matrix you read like this, after the A comes a B, so we come here. Then we have a B, and after the B comes another B. And then we have a B, and after the B, we predict another A. So I recorded that here as well. And after that A comes, oh, another B. So, okay, so that's good, and that goes again, and then after that B comes another B. The AA doesn't seem to happen, like a double A does not, okay, we can already fine tune our prediction. I predict, I dare to predict, based on my training of my neural network, that AA doesn't happen. A, it's just, it's just very unlikely, it's like zero probability that it happens. But uh, what happens next? I have a B, and I don't know what happens. Well, according to what I see here and what I recorded here, after B, there could be an A or there could be another B. That has happened before. And I don't know what will happen next. Well, it would make sense that it would be B, A, right? And it would be A, B, B, A, B, B. It would be make sense that the next, but I do not know. So I cannot make a very good prediction of what happens next. And well, that's been a problem we've been struggling with, with recurrent neural, recurrent neural nets. And I simplify here a lot. And the solution to that was that we go a little bit more long-term. And these are the famous long, short-term memories. And the big breakthrough here came much later, around the year 2010. So that's also when you started all these speech recognition softwares to come onto the market, all the Alexas and Series and Echoes and Hey Googles and and I don't know what, uh, we started to talk with machines thanks to the long short-term uh, memory. And basically what they came up with is they have a longer memory. So let's don't look at one letter at a time as a prediction, but let look at two letters as a building block. And we already talked about that. If you have more data from the past, you can make better predictions. So if you just record as a condition, bigger data, we can make better predictions. Let's see how that works out here. We have A, B, and after AB, I, we record in our training of our neural net, we train our neural net now, there's a B. Then we have, go one further, BB, next comes an A. Then we have BA, next comes a B. And then we have AB again. Oh yeah, we update this here to two. If this goes too fast, feel free to, to slow it down and, and, and rewind it. Then we have BB again, and yeah, after BB comes A, and now comes BA again. I can make a pretty clear prediction. i have like, according to what I saw, all of these never happened according to I was trained, and the neural net can then is trained on something. So it makes predictions of what it's been trained on. And according to what I've seen right now, the next letter should be B, right? Because that's, that's, like, that's what comes after BA. So by having a longer memory, I solved my uncertainty. I make better predictions uh, about the future. And that is the idea. You just feed longer uh, prompts that's a technical term, longer chunks into this neural net. Um, could be a syllabus, could be an entire word, could be an entire sentence, could be an entire book that you feed into it. Uh, but that's basically the idea. So that we make the chunks slowly but surely longer and longer. And if you are here, you can already see, okay, there's A, B, 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 A, A, A B, A, B, A, B, 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 A, and then probably B A B. So you see, it's always A B B A B B A B B basically. So that's how I how I set it up. And so the longer the prompt, the said repeat myself is a technical term. The longer uh, the prediction. So the better the prediction because the more stable the ground you're on, and you can better sort things to like okay, no, that's if that is the condition. Then if then if then that's how algorithms work. Now we never have complete certainty. 
It, it usually is not deterministic like in these toy models that I come up with here. In, in theoretical computer science, we do that and we come up with these completely predictable, but it usually in social reality, it never is. It's always a game of probability. And we are very used to that actually, making these in the machines help us in seeing like what is most likely to come next. For example, been using Google for many years and search engines and you type in something and there's an autocomplete and the autocomplete recommends you, well, what is about to come next? And here I type, attention is a limited resource, yes, or attention is all you need. Or just like, attention is all you need, really? Yes, that is the famous paper that then came to the logical conclusion that if it's useful to make the input longer and longer and longer, and that helps us to fine tune our predictions, why don't we just take everything as an input and feed it in at once, in parallel? I mean, yeah, it, it had to it had to go to that. It had to come to that one, right? I mean, that's that's the logical outburst then. And that is called transformers. So these are the famous transformers that are the basis of, for example, large language model like BARD and ChatGPT. And it's actually been innovated by researchers at Google and the University of Toronto, which has always been leading in, in deep learning with, with Professor Jeffrey Hinton there. And Google has pioneered it, so it wasn't ChatGPT and OpenAI, and they wrote this paper with a little bit tongue-in-cheek, tongue, tongue in cheek, attention is all you need, and that paper really blew people's mind. It got, in the first five years, it has, I don't know, 75,000, 80,000 citations. That's outrageous. That's the most influential scientific works, like Darwin's Origin of Species, maybe. Like, that's the ballpark where it had the scientific impact it had. It was really impressive, and it blew people's mind. So what, what is that about? What is attention is all you need about. Well, the attention algorithm was actually known before, well, way before. So this was published 2017 and this paper is from 2015. <laughs> Things go very fast here. So it was like two years before, we already knew that. And basically, well, this is one of the matrices that I showed you and that I showed before, like what's the probability? And you can see here when you wanna predict the next word, or I think this is from a translation exercise from French to English, you can see, for example, if you have a dot, it's not clear what comes next. So there is not a clear, if it would be a diagonal, there's only, okay, after this word comes this, clear. I can make a prediction here, but after a dot, I'm not sure what happens next. So the idea is then from the entire input that you have, pay attention. Pay attention to what's actually, what's actually important. So that's why attention is all, what do you need to pay attention to from the past in order to better predict the future? And that example that I use here, is to complete the sentence. And since here, all the input is being fed in in parallel, well, first of all, that gives me a lot of advantages in the computing that I can use. And second of all, I can also understand the context much better because I have, I have everything available. I have a very good memory, everything right there. But I have, the problem is what do we need to pay attention to? And what this paper basically contributed to is what they call the self-attention mechanism. So you basically pay attention to yourself, to your own input. And bear with me, I will explain that. So bear with me. So for example, if I take the phrase bear with me, and I put it into transformer deep neural net that transfers images that it computes images, for example, Dali, that's what I got bear with me. And that's what the problem of self-attention is basically about. Why did this generative AI generate an image that says, bear with me like this? Well, it's comical uh, and it's funny because it didn't have enough context. It didn't know where to put the attention. It just, I just told it, draw a bear with me. And it said, like, draw a bear with me, <laughs> right? But that's not what I meant because the context here is we in a lecture. I'm explaining a concept. And so I said, bear with me. So of course, if it would have had all the context, it would have been able to put it into its place and understand the meaning of the word bear. And the meaning of the word bear can have different meanings as so many other words. For example, if the word geologist comes up and then the word rock, it probably has a different meaning than if in the vicinity or in the context of the word rock, you read about ACDC and Metallica. Then probably it's a different rock we are talking about. Or if there's dog or tree in the vicinity of the word bark. So putting everything in at once, that's what these transformers do. And then like we also re still record 
the sequence. It's called the positional encoding. But basically, that's the idea. And, th and that allows, for example, things that for, for these large language models to really have understanding. That's also why they have a perfect memory. That's why with a chat, a large language model chatbot, you can talk for hours and it will still remember what has been going on because it is everything available there at once. And that's what these large language models are actually based on, on these transformers. They feed in all the input at once. Now, at the heart of it, it's still extremely important to remember what they do is these transformers, large language models, these uh, magical chatbots that we are talking with for hours, basically a program to predict the next, not the next word, to predict the next prompt. It's kind of like a, a syllable, you could say, like a part of a word that has a meaning. And they predict just the next one of that. And, and that's what they do. And that's all they do. So that makes them sound a lot like humans because they have been fed with a lot of human data and they have a lot of degrees of freedom. So ChatGPT generation number two, ChatGPT two had 1.5 billion parameters. You can think about these neural nets and their weights. The third generation had 175 billion and ChatGPT four, a uh, thousand billion. So there's a lot of, 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 of weights and a lot of human text language that has been fed into it, terabytes of data. And that makes them then just predicting the next thing makes them sound like humans, a lot like humans. That's why they passed what's called the Turing test. And that's basically the Turing test was a challenge to see like, can we, ex couldn't we distinguish a human from a machine? Maybe just talk with it. And with these chatbots, we have proven like, no, you can just distinguish them. So they sound extremely like humans because that's what they do. They replicate, they regurgitate human language and therefore sound like a human. And therefore you feel like it's, it's, it's very human-like. And therefore it's actually very human-like. Now, the task is not to tell you the truth. The, ta the task is what they are programmed. That's also why I extended myself explained it, is to just sound like a human. And if you talk with a human, there's also no guarantee that they tell you the truth. Maybe they want to manipulate you. Maybe, maybe they don't know the truth. Maybe there's no bad intention there. Maybe they just want to be liked. Many humans want to be liked. So in that sense, it's much more likely that you fall in love with a large language model than if you, that you find the right scientific citation <laughs> that is correctly cited. Because that's not, I mean, it's, it might sound like a scientific citation, but just from the pure large language model itself, that's not the task. It's the task is to sound like you. And if you don't trust me, let's ask, our large language models, so let's ask ChatGPT, are large language models rather trained to sound like a human or to speak the truth? Large language models like ChatGPT4 are trained to generate human-like text based on the data they were trained on. Their main aim is not to speak the truth or to propagate any kind of falsehood either, no. Instead, they generate responses based on patterns they've learned during their training. So. Next time you use these chatbots to finish your homework, be aware of that, be aware of that distinction. Now there's much more to say about that, but we have to move on to other aspects of the digital age for now.